So do whatever it is that, I don't know, you do when you're not in class. Okay? Um, that test will cover where we left off last, last time in Chapter 2, and then all of Chapter 3, and we'll see about Chapter 4, I'm not sure. All right. Um, also, on Thursday, I w I'm going to send out a little screencast, kind of like what I have when I record the uh, when I record the class. It won't be long, but it's just going to sort of get us a little bit further into Chapter Three. Uh, it'll just sort of be me talking. It's not going to be wrong, maybe 20 minutes or so. And I'd like for y'all to all watch that. Just sort of, I don't know. They like for us to make up for lost class time when we do that. Okay. And then I know what everybody's anxious to hear about is what? What are you anxious to hear about? No. That the graph that we made last time, because you remember, let me show you, Let's see if I can pull it up right quick. That's what y'all were excited about? Yes. Um, Y'all had a really nice plot, actually. Like the other guy, this guy from Pennsylvania I'm working with, his plot was just all jumbled up and like the the it was nothing. It was just noise. But when I looked at yours, it looked really nice. I'm gonna show you. Uh, where is it? Walk data. Let's see if the online version will get the graph. I think it will. Yeah, there it is. There it is. That's a nice linear graph. That's your walking speed versus the square root of like stride length over leg length or something. I forget exactly what it is. But the model predicts that this this graph will be a, a straight line. And it is a really nice straight line. There's some scatter because, you know, you're dealing with people. And like some of you walk slower than you normally would and some of you walk faster than you normally would. But it still comes out with a really nice linear graph. So I really appreciate your work on that. Y'all are obviously taking it seriously. Whereas that other guy's class, not taking it seriously at all. Okay? So y'all are awesome, right? Yes. Good job. Good job. You can walk normally. Okay. We might do something with that a little later. All right. We've been working on energy. Oh, and then I also want to just tell you about the quizzes. You know, as you know with the quizzes... I don't know if you did well or not well. Not well, that's fine. The quizzes are a really nice place to not do well. I want you to be prepared for the quizzes, but if you're not going to do well, I want you to not do well on the quizzes because, you know, we'll drop those lowest grades. You'll probably have two, at least two, maybe even three drop grades. Uh, I don't want you to depend on them all the time because you do need some good grades on those quizzes. But uh, if you did poorly, eh, get it next time, okay? Does that make you feel a little better if you didn't? It didn't make you feel better at all? Okay. But just do better next time if you didn't do well. It's a good place to fail. It's a good place to mess up. It's a good place to practice for the exam. That's really what the purpose is there for. Okay. Um, so last time we talked about energy and gravitational potential energy. We watched that video in the circus video. Y'all all ran out and watched that series about the circus, the reality show with the circus. The show is actually a bit more interesting. It's not all about the science and stuff. They just created those videos to, to deal with the science. It's like an extra little project because, you know, it's public television. But um, they did talk about elastic energy. And that's another type of energy that we'll deal with, elastic energy. And, in fact, it plays a big role in the body. Elastic energy, or well, energy... We'll call this elastic potential energy. Uh, elastic energy is the energy when you have something that you stretch it, then it, can, it has the potential for motion. So if I have a rubber band and I shoot it at somebody and it pops them in the eye, the elastic potential energy in that rubber band is converted into kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, which uh, you know, causes it to move. 
So elastic potential energy, this is the energy contained in things that stretch. Like a rubber band, for example. If you stretch a rubber band, it then has the, uh, the potential for motion. I have a little audio clip that I want to share with you. You ever listen to the Get Fit guy? He's on iTunes. He's part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast series. They have, especially of athletic trainers, they have all sorts of stuff that he talks about. And we'll listen to a couple of his podcasts. But I have one here that's uh, about the, your muscles and whether or not you should have flexible muscles or flexible tendons or whatever. And the advantages and the disadvantages of being really, really flexible or not, are, are not very flexible at all. So let's listen to this. This is a Get Fit guy. This is a fairly old podcast, but he puts out one like every week, I think. Dude food stuff. Um, all right, so your muscles contain this elastic energy. And not only do they contain, but they convey it to your body. You know, causing you to run or jump or whatever it is that you do and you know, whatever type of athlete you are. All right, so um, he talks about the stiffness. We have a term called the, uh, the spring constant. Your book, I don't think, talks about this, but just a quick little side on the spring constant. Uh, the spring constant, or the force due to a spring, is equal to the spring constant times x. So this is our spring constant. This is the amount that we stretch, or the, the distance that we stretch, whatever it is. So for example, if we have a rubber band, I went and grabbed one. You know, this has a certain spring constant. Uh, and depending on the spring constant will tell me what kind of force I get when I stretch the rubber band. Do you think that this has a bigger or a smaller spring constant than, say, I don't know, one of those bands that you have in the gym that you do exercises with? Bigger or smaller? This has a quite a bit smaller because the force, when I pull on it, the force is quite a bit smaller than one of those elastic bands that you can work out with in the gym or wherever, at home or whatever. Um, so the spring constant is different for different materials. The bigger the spring constant, the bigger the force that you'll get. Like, for example, the springs on your car, really, really big spring constant in comparison to this. Another thing that can change the force that you can get is the distance that you stretch it. So like those elastic bands in the gym, if you stretch them really far, you'll get more and more force. That's why people use them, because you get this variable force. Initially, you get a small force. As you go farther and farther and farther with those things, you get a bigger and bigger force. You know what I'm talking about? Those elastic bands with the handles on? Yeah. So if I pull this a little bit, I just get a little bit of force. As I keep pulling it more and more, I get more and more force. Right? Because my force is dependent upon linearly with my distance. So if x goes up, my force goes up as well. All right. I do want you to know this. So it's not in the book. I'm pretty sure they don't talk about spring constant, but please do, please do know this because it is pretty important for elastic and energy. So if I have a bigger spring constant, then I'll, I'll contain more energy. And if I have a bigger, uh, if I stretch it longer, if my elongation is bigger, then I'll also have more energy, right? That sort of makes sense, right? Because if I shoot this, if I pull it this distance and I shoot it, it just goes there. But if I pull it back a lot farther, like this, if I pull it back a longer distance, how, is it going to go further or closer or what? And you go further, right? It goes a lot farther because I give it more energy. Uh, and that's wrapped up in the force that if I pull it back farther, I get more energy because I get a bigger force. Okay. Um, let's look at some other types of energy. Your book describes the mechanical energy. By the way, if y'all are concerned, like my knee injury is a lot better now 
I, I started doing strength training and about a year of strength training, and it's a lot better now. And I've actually started running again. Like, I haven't ran in a decade because I had various injuries that kept me from running. And finally, after a whole decade of not running at all, I'm able to run again, which is great because I really love to run. Oh, I sent you my race picture, right? Did I send you all that? Yeah. Did you all think, gosh, I didn't know that he could do that. Is that what you thought? Okay. All right, so mechanical energy. This is the sum of U and K. Remember U, that's our, pot our gravitational potential energy. And K, that's our kinetic energy. Uh, this gravitational potential energy is dependent upon position. Remember U is equal to mg times h. And then our kinetic energy is equal is uh, dependent upon speed. Remember our kinetic energy was 1 half mv squared. Um, and the mechanical energy is just the sum of those. We have a law concerning this mechanical energy. It's called the conservation of energy, the law of conservation of energy. And this concerns our mechanical energy, so it considers a law of position and speed. The energy of position, that's potential energy, and speed, or motion. So the law of conservation of energy will deal both with this kinetic energy and our gravitational potential energy. And basically what it says is that my total energy is always going to be the same. It's conserved. It will always remain the same. So uh, the total, what this law says is that the total amount of energy mechanical energy remains constant. It's conserved. That means that it's neither loss nor gain in a system. Uh, in particular, this total amount of mechanical energy is constant in a closed system. And when I say a closed system, that means there are no external forces acting on the system. External forces would do work on the system. And remember, work causes energy or work creates energy. If there are no external forces, that means I'm not adding any energy to the system, nor am I taking away energy from the system. And so the total amount of me mechanical energy will remain constant. Okay. Uh, if you want to think about this in terms of an equation, you can. In fact, we will. So we can say that the, uh, the total amount of energy is equal to U plus K and that this is constant. In particular, We'll say that E initial is equal to E final. So if I have energy at some point in a system, I'm going to have that same energy at, at another point in the system. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say that I have a roller coaster. Now if you look back at the old test, you'll see some questions like this. But let's say that I have a roller coaster that looks like this. And I have a cart on the roller coaster right here. And it has initially a speed equal to zero. We'll say that this distance is h. We'll say that this distance is h over 2. And we'll say that this distance is h over 3. And then it comes up to some point at this part, and it'll stop. So this, this, uh, this cart, this roller coaster, it'll go down. It'll go over this hop. 
this hump, and then it'll come up here at some point, and it's going to stop. Uh, let's give, let's label some of these. Let's call this point A. Actually, no, not A. Let's call this point A, B, C, D, and this point, which we don't know where it is. We'll call that E. At which of these points, where is the kinetic energy at its greatest? Which of these points? Where is my kinetic energy at its maximum value? As this cart moves through this system, there are no external forces acting on it, so it's a closed system, and so the conservation of energy will apply. Where is the kinetic energy at its greatest, at point A, B, C, D, or E? Where is the kinetic energy at its greatest? Where is the kinetic energy the greatest? And again, to remind you, this card is at rest at point A. It moves down, and then it comes up, comes up. And then at some point, it's going to come up here, and it'll stop before it goes back. It falls back down, I guess. So where is the kinetic energy at its greatest value? Uh, just a few more seconds. All right, I'll stop at uh, one ten. One ten. Okay, I'm not going to show you right off wh where you are. So now I want to know: instead of where is the kinetic energy the greatest, where is the potential energy the greatest? What do you mean it's not working? Right. Where do you think the potential energy is at its greatest? All right. I'm going to stop in 42, at 42. Uh, now I want to know, where is the speed the greatest? Where does it have the greatest speed in this system? Where is it going the fastest? Where is this, this cart going at its fastest speed? Okay, I'll stop at 30. Five more seconds. Does everybody have a cold today? No. Just Morgan and Adele. Y'all look miserable. Yeah, I understand. I was just there a couple of days ago. Okay, so let's go back and look at some of these. So this was question one. Where is the kinetic energy at its greatest value? And B is right there because initially, look, what type of energy do I have up here? What type of energy? Do I have potential, kinetic, or both? I only have potential energy here. So U here is at its maximum value, and K is equal to zero. Now, at point B, my U is equal to zero, and my kinetic energy is at its maximum value. Okay? Uh, and then the next question was where is the potential energy at its greatest? That was A, as we already said. We know that it's at its greatest value there because it's at its greatest height. Okay? And also it's not moving. So we'll come back to that in just a minute. And then question three. You had where is the speed the greatest, and B is correct. But remember, that's the, the same answer as number one. Wherever the speed is greatest, then the, uh, the, potential the uh, kinetic energy is greatest. 
Now let's say instead of having it at rest here, I'm going to say that the, the speed is greater than zero. So this cart comes up over the hill and it already has a speed at this point. So no longer is the kinetic energy equal to zero. Now it has some kinetic energy. And now I want to ask you the question, where is the potential energy at its greatest value? Where is the potential energy at its greatest value? Okay, I'm going to stop at uh, 30 seconds, 30. Okay, we're all over the board here. Uh, where, if, if my speed is zero right here, to what height is it going to come to over here at point E? Will it be at H, below H, or above H? Let's see what you think about that. We'll come back to this question and we'll address it. So if my speed is zero, if V equals zero, the height at E is bigger than H, we'll call that A, smaller than H, or is it equal to H? Where H, of course, is you know this point right here. What do you think? If the speed of the cart is equal to zero over here, how far does the cart come up over here? Does it come above the level of H, below the level of H, or does it come exactly up to this point? What do you think? Okay, we're all over the board here. Let me, uh, I'm going to leave this running because you all have different answers. You're all, uh, you're basically split three ways. Imagine that I have a certain amount of energy. Let's say that I have, I don't know, 12 joules of energy right here. I have 12 joules of energy. Right here then, my potential energy is 12 joules. My kinetic energy is zero. Down here, my kinetic energy has what value? It has 12 because it's going to be 12 here and then this will be zero. But I'm still going to have 12 joules of energy right here. Up here, I'm going to have some combination. Like I'll have, uh, pro well, I'll have six joules of potential and six joules of kinetic energy. I know that it's split evenly because my height now is half what it originally was. But just know that I have some potential and I have some kinetic. Right here, I'll have... Uh, four joules of potential energy and eight joules of kinetic energy. I have less potential energy than I had over here, but I still have some kinetic energy, so that thing is moving. But still, it adds up to equal 12 joules. And then up here, I know that my speed is going to zero, so what is going to be my potential energy? If my speed goes to zero, that means my kinetic energy is what? If the speed is zero, the kinetic energy is what? is zero, right. And so what is going to be my potential energy? 12, right. So how does the height compare at point E to point A? And I'll stop in about five seconds at 2.15. All right. You're moving in the right direction. I'll stop at 2.18. Okay, so the right answer there is C. Uh, now let's go back to that previous question. Yeah. What was this question? Do you remember? Oh, where is the potential energy? Oh, shoot, I don't even remember. Oh, no, no. If the speed is greater than zero, where is the potential energy the greatest? What do you all think now? Do you all remember what you put? But what do you think the answer is? Just tell me. No, it's not B. It's not B. It's what? Okay, let me ask you a different question. So, if the if the speed is greater than zero here, it's not going to have 12 joules. It's going to have 14 joules or whatever, right? 
It'll have 14 joules because it'll have 12 joules, joules of potential energy plus an extra 2 joules of kinetic energy. You with me? I got this little extra kinetic energy sitting in this cart, making it go a certain speed there. Just a little bit extra. And so as it goes down through here, it's going to do all this business. I'll have uh, potential and kinetic here. I'll have only kinetic energy here, but I'm going to have 14 joules of kinetic energy now because, you know, it's at a position of zero, so the potential energy is zero, but it's going to be going faster than it was before. So where is it going to go now? Is it going to stop below, above, at, or above the level H if it had an initial speed over there? What do y'all think? It's going to stop above the level H because it's going to have now 14 joules of energy, making it stop somewhere up here, just a little bit higher. So the answer to this question, where does it have the most potential energy if the speed is initially greater than zero? What's the answer? E is the right answer, because it's going to go up to a higher height. All right, we'll see some more questions like that later, and you can look back at the quizzes. Yeah, look back at the old tests and quizzes, and there are other questions as well. Actually, let's go ahead and pull one of those up and just make sure we got that, because it's a fairly important concept uh, that I want you to get. Let's see, probably exam two. Yeah, so here we go. Let's zoom this in. We'll look at number 12 first. And then we'll look at 13. This is uh, last, semester, last spring's exam. Um, consider this roller coaster. At which location does the cart have the most potential energy? A, B, C, D, or E? Or does it have the same potential energy at all locations? Oh, and here it looks like I'm using P, E for uh, potential energy, but we'll use U. Where does it have the most potential energy? A, B, C, D, or E? Okay, doing well. I got this. All right, I'll stop at uh, 35, 35. Okay, good. A is the right word. Let's do this next one. Okay, and then we'll come back. So, uh, consider the roller coaster. Which location does it have the highest speed? Is it A, B, C, or D? Where does it have the highest speed, A, B, C, or D? Okay, awesome. I'm going to stop at uh, 18. Okay, wow, 100%. you got to be kidding me. Yeah, I'm about to give you one. Just hold on. First, I want to tell you, last night, we sort of had this little scare. The police came to our house. Like, the lights were on, and they were knocking on the door. I went to the door, and uh, the policeman said, oh, Mr. Young, I said, yes, can I have a quick word? And I said, sure, velocity. A quick word. Can I have a quick word? And I said, sure, velocity. That didn't actually happen. That was a joke, you see. <laughs> okay, let's try. Uh, now we'll come back to this later. All right. So that's the conservation of potential energy. You will have some questions like that uh, concerning potential energy. There's lots of stuff that you can do with, with that idea that energy is conserved, but we're not going to get too much into that, okay? Uh, let's look. We have some other types of energy. Your book just sort of goes through these, and I'll do the same. Uh, just sort of be aware that these exist. Your book describe, gives like a paragraph each, I think. So electrical energy, we'll get into this in a later chapter. This is the uh, energy of charges. So, for example, if I have two positive charges, there are forces acting on these, right? You all heard this. Light charges repel. Opposite charges attract. If I were to let these things go, they'd zoom off 
in the opposite directions. So they contain energy. There is potential energy stored there. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss that later. There is internal energy. He calls it internal energy. And we'll get into this. This is the energy of molecules or atoms. As they move. You remember uh, in the previous chapter we talked about superfluids and uh, absolute zero, the temperature absolute zero, and talked about how at in a material, in a, a, a an element or in a in a uh, you know compound or whatever, that those molecules and atoms are always moving. So like inside your desk, for example, the molecules and atoms are moving back and forth, and so that's the internal energy. There's also heat. Heat is the transfer of energy, or the transfer of thermal energy in particular. Uh, more about this later. We'll deal a lot with heat in this chapter, actually. Uh, chemical energy. This is the uh, potential energy stored in materials. Because of the position of their charges. This goes back to our electrical energy, that if I have a collection of charges, that they have a certain amount of energy just because of the way that they're configured. That if I have two positive charges, they'll fly apart from one another. And if they fly apart, that means that they have potential energy. And so in a similar way, in chemicals, and you know, chemistry is all about this, is how do we transfer that energy from one chemical or one reaction to another? Uh, so chemical energy has to do with those actual charges that the molecules or atoms have. Um, let's see, electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic energy. We'll have a whole chapter on this later. So, you know, this is light, for example. They tell you I've, I visited my second, my girl's second grade class. I was like, they're sub. Did I tell you about this? And the UV beads, did I tell you all? Okay, yeah. So that's electromagnetic energy. And again, we'll have a whole chapter on that later. Um, acoustic energy, sound. Again, another chapter. The next chapter, actually, probably my favorite chapter the one on sound, and then nuclear energy. We won't get to this, but this is just energy associated with the nucleus of an atom. Just to be familiar with those, sort of know roughly what they refer to, uh, nuclear energy again, just the nucleus of an atom. There's a lot of energy contained within the protons and neutrons of an atom, uh, so just know, know that that exists. All right. Let's define power. Can I go down from here? Power is defined as uh, work over time. Oh, I had a friend named Power once. You ever heard that? Yeah, that was his name, Power. Huh? Oh, did I tell y'all the joke already? We didn't go through all the different types of energy, did we? Oh, yeah, we did define power. I'm sorry. Oh, man, I'd set it up and everything. Never mind. Never mind. Okay, so power is work over time. Uh, it's measured at, it's joules per second or watts. 
Let's do a little concept test. We've done some of these. Am I right about that? Oh gosh, where do we stop? Did that one, did that one. Okay, we haven't done this one. Right, we have not done this one. Okay, by what factor does the kinetic energy of a car change when its speed is tripled? And let me just remind you what kinetic energy is. You know, you'll have an equation sheet on the test, but the kinetic energy is one half m v squared. One half m v squared. So what factor does the kinetic energy of a car change when its speed is tripled. All right, I'll stop at uh, 50. Okay, we're sort of spread out here, but D is the right answer. Listen, make sure that you're able to answer these type questions, because you'll certain. D is the right answer. Why did you have to say something, he's saying, right? Why does she have to say anything? They'll be waiting for you, yeah. All right, so uh, yeah, E is, D is the right answer, because Listen, guys, make sure that you're able to do these, where I have these different types of relationships, linear or quadratic relationships. But here, imagine that if I triple v, it's 3 squared, so I get a factor of 9 over here. So if I were to plot the kinetic energy versus the speed, it looks like this. It's a parabola, right? Because that's what a, a quadratic, this k versus v squared looks like this. So as my V increases, my kinetic energy increases. The faster and faster you go, the more and more energy you need. Make sure you understand that relationship at, sort of, that relationship at its basic level. Two stones, one twice the mass, are dropped from a cliff. Just before hitting the ground, what is the kinetic energy of the heavy stone compared to the light stone? One heavy stone, one light stone, you drop them from the edge of a cliff. How do their kinetic energies compare just before they hit the ground at the bottom? The heavy stone has a quarter the energy, half as much energy, the same, twice as much, or four times as much. A heavy stone is twice the mass. How are their speeds going to compare? Y'all are sort of all over the board. I think you're missing this key aspect. Which one will drop faster? They're going to be the same. Right? They will fall at the same rate. Remember, uh, well, I don't have anything. But if I drop a heavy thing and a light thing, they both accelerate at the same rate. That's our acceleration due to gravity. And so these are going to be falling directly together all the way down. It doesn't matter about their weight. It's only the acceleration due to gravity. All right, so they're going to be going the same speed at the bottom. That, that helps some. Oh, wait, no. no. Sorry. All right, I'm going to stop at 1.30, I'll tell you. Okay. They, are, they do have the same speed, but remember, kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. So I can change the kinetic energy in a couple of ways. I can change the speed, like in the previous problem, or I can change the mass. Now here, these both have the same speed, but I'm doubling the mass. So that means I'm going to double my kinetic energy. So D is the right answer. The heavy stone has twice the energy as the light stone because it has twice the mass. They have the same speed, 
but it has twice the mass. Uh, let's see, I'll give the other this one. Just, I did say the answer to this, but let's just make sure we're on it. All right, I'll stop at um, 28, 28. Steve is right. right. So they, they both go the same speed. They both accelerate at the same rate. Remember how we defer define positive, negative, and zero work here. Get on a skateboard, he's moving at two meters per second. A force acts on him. Then he's moving faster at three meters per second. What can you say about the work done on the child? Positive, negative, or zero? Stop at 35. 35. Okay, good. A is right. Remember our work energy theorem, that work causes a change in energy. Here, my energy has changed in the positive way. He had a little bit of energy, and then he had more energy. So my delta E, my change in energy, is positive, and so the work is also positive. Let's try this one. Think about this one. This one's a little bit interesting. What is it? At Nichols? Yeah. Oh, come on. Y'all pay good money for those classes. It shouldn't make you happy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't want y'all to be in danger. Sure. All right. I'm serious. Okay. Here, which takes more energy to go from 0 to 30 or 30 to 60 miles an hour? Or is it the same? Which requires more energy to go from 0 to 30, 30 to 60, or is it both the same? Which requires more energy, right? All right, I'm going to stop at 112, 112. I don't even know if it will let me select the right answer. Because maybe I'll just let you know, maybe up here I can do it. Is B. What did I say about y'all earlier? Awesome. I'm going to take it back. Yeah, let me show you. All right, so remember our relationship between kinetic energy and speed? It looks like this, right? It's a, it's a parabola. And so if I go from, say, well, let's say 0 to 30, look, I've required that much energy. But if I go from 30 to 60, I've required that much energy. It takes a lot more energy to go faster because I have this relationship between the kinetic energy and the speed, that's a quadratic relationship. So if I double my speed, I'm going to quadruple the amount of energy that's required. Okay? It takes a lot more energy. That's why, I mean, partly your car is just designed to go at a certain speed. And so you get the best gas mileage at, you know, 50 miles an hour or whatever it is. But part of it is that if you just go at 70 miles an hour, it just takes a lot more energy to move that car down the road. And so your gas mileage is not as good if you go 70 or 80 miles an hour as if, uh, instead of if you're going like 45. I don't know what the optimal is now. But. And also, y'all ride bikes? Ever ride a bike? 
there's a huge difference between going 10 to 15 miles an hour than going 15 to 20 miles an hour. You ask anybody that rides a bike, that's a huge difference between 10 and 15 and 15 and 20. But to go at 20 miles an hour requires a lot more energy than it does to get, say, to go 15 miles an hour. All right? Remember that relationship. You can expect to see some questions in this vein on the test coming up. Um, Okay, we'll do a couple more. Is it possible for the kinetic energy of an object to be negative? Can you have negative energy? Alrighty, I'll stop at... Uh, 35, 35. Okay, the answer is B. So remember, work can be negative, and if you have negative work, it means that you're taking away energy. Our work can be positive, and that means you're giving energy, work energy theorem. But kinetic energy, it can only ever be positive. Because even if our speed was a negative in a sense, and you can't have a negative velocity, it's a V squared, right? So that negative goes away when you try to calculate it. So if you forget, just remember it was V squared. So even if it is negative, the negative goes away. Mass, of course, can never be negative. Because that just doesn't make sense. Um, we're going to skip this one. I'm not going to let you out early. Is that what you're asking? It doesn't have a lot of words, but let's try it. No, it's a good question. No, I'm not going to read. You're worse than my 10-year-old son. Daddy, will you pour my milk? He wants me to pour his milk every morning. I'm like, what am I? Serve it? Pour your milk? Okay, so this is asking... You have a, a mass on a spring like this. It's moving up and down, up and down. What happens as the mass uh, goes down? So I have a mass, and as it goes down, what happens to the elastic potential energy? Does it increase or decrease? And what happens to the gravitational potential energy? Does it increase or decrease? As my mass moves downward, what happens to the elastic potential energy? And then also what happens to the gravitational potential energy? All right, I'll stop at 122, 122. I don't even know now. What is it? Uh, so this rubber band's getting longer, so potential energy to that is when I do what? Increase. If I move an object from here to here, what happens to its gravitational potential energy? Remember our gravitational potential energy, which is U, is equal to mg times h. So what I'm doing is I'm going from a, high, a big h to a smaller h. What's happening to my gravitational potential energy? It's decreasing, right. So what is that? That's, that's d is the right answer. Okay, let's try this one. This one was actually on an old test. Three balls of equal mass start from rest and roll down different ramps. All the ramps have the same height, but they're different. One is shorter than two, is shorter than three. Which will have the greater speed at the bottom? It's either, I'm sorry, one is A, two is B, three is C. So let it be A, B, C, or is it D, the same speed for all balls?
I'm going to tell the president. Never send out a message in the middle of my class. They're calling you? I'm sorry. All right, y'all bear with me a few more minutes, okay? Uh, I'll stop at 103, 103. Okay, good. D is right. I lost this class like five minutes ago. Okay, they all start at the same height, right? So they all have a certain amount of potential energy that's all the same. So then they're all going to have the same energy at the bottom. Okay? doesn't matter about the shape of the, of the, uh, the plane, the inclined plane. It's still going to be the same. They have, a certain, they have 10 joules up here. They're going to have 10 joules down here. Okay? Conservation of energy. Yeah, I think we'll just wrap these up. We just have about five or six more questions. So, uh, Mike applied 10 newtons of force over 3 meters in 10 seconds. Joe applied the same force over the same distance in one minute. Who did more work? Remember our work expression. Our work is equal to F times D when they're in the same direction. Um, Mike does it in 10 seconds. Joe does it in one minute. Who does more work? OK, I'll stop at 50, 50. All right. The answer here is, what do y'all think? It is, no, it's C is the right answer. Uh, C is the right answer because, look, in our expression for work, there's no time. If I were to ask you who did more power, that would be a different expression because power is work over time. But here with work, we're really just concerned with the force and the displacement or the distance. Uh, now we have the exact same thing. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Mike does five joules in 10 seconds. Joe does three joules of work in five seconds. Who here does the greater power? Does Mike, Joe, or both of them, Mike or Joe produce more power or both of them? All right, let's stop at uh, 35, 35. Okay, it is right that Joe, even though he does less work, he does more power. Mike does a half a watt, Joe does 0. 0.6 watts. 5 over 10 versus 3 over 5. Let's another minute, I know you're all ready to go. Okay, it's not raining yet. Engine number one produces twice the power of engine number two. Can we conclude that engine one does twice as much work as engine two? So you have, I don't know, 300 horsepower engine, 150 horsepower engine. Can you conclude that the 300 horsepower does twice the work? I think we have one more after this. All right, I'll stop at 30. Okay, the answer is no. Let me just show you this last question. Uh, oh, kilowatt hour. Um, is this a measure of energy, power, current, or voltage? It's a measure of energy. Kilowatt hour is not a measure of power. It's a measure of energy. We might hit back on that next time. Remember, no class on Thursday. I'll send a notice out. Uh, and I'll see you on Tuesday in preparation for our exam on next Thursday, okay? Y'all be safe today. I'll see you next week.